of the United States, United States of America. America. Of America. Republic. Yes, the Republic. Republic. Which yeah. would stand one, one nation, nation under, under God, God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That was word music. Thank you. Okay, so first on the agenda, we have, uh, we don't have a student joining us, but Marie, I think back a while, we have an update from our high school representative. Yes, I'm very pleased to say that uh, Matthew Dunnigan, who's been providing the reports at recent meetings, reached out to me on Sunday and asked me if we would like a report from the students um, sent to me. So he gave me three items. And the first one is a celebration of our Gilderland Unified Bowling Team who won the championship this, this season. So that's awesome. Um, and then the next two are less good oh. news. One was that our, our um, production of Chicago is postponed and uh, we don't know the new dates, but we're hopeful that we will see that show on our stage. And then also uh, the Unified uh, basketball season will be starting soon if we get back into school. So he was excited about those three things. So thank you, Matthew, for sharing that in information. Thank you. Next, we have the 2020-2021 budget development. And we had a presentation last board meeting and we had an opportunity to first ask some questions. So this is another opportunity for questions. Does anybody have questions? Do, do we know, Seema or Neil, when we're going to be um, hearing anything at all? You know, in terms of next year, we, not even worried this year. I um, mean, the state budget? Yeah. yeah. Um, supposedly it's still on track according to the governor for April 1st. That was the last word I heard. Um, don't know that for sure that it will happen within that time frame or not. As you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, so we're anxious to know as well as um, everybody else as to when that budget may be adopted. But I don't think it's out of the question that it may not happen by April 1st either, uh, given certain the circumstances we're under at this time. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, Seema. Mm -hmm. uh, probably for Neil. Uh, in the development process for the budget, Neil, uh, was any thought given into what, you know, about the school start time research that we're doing and the possibilities of that? Was that figured in in any way? Uh, not at this time. We, we are working and have worked with a vendor uh, looking at options. Uh, we've had an opportunity to see what um, those possibilities are but uh, we are working through them to make sure that the times that we uh, were given are possible given the structure of our roads. So we're doing a more in-depth analysis of making sure that we can map the runs and the runs will fit within the timeframes that we've established for the schools. Uh, so it's taking a large view look from the part of the consultant in what might be possible to actually mapping our individual bus routes, timing them out, and making sure we can get to every school we need to get to on time, so make the proper connections in a timely fashion. Uh, and that work is happening now, but it is a lot of in-depth work that we're working well, on. Well, considering we've talked about our, bud, our bus plans and our proposition there, is, am I correct to think that we're not thinking about doing anything this September? Can I, can I jump in here? This is... Um, so in the budget we presented on March 10th, um, we did not factor in any potential changes for the bus routes because at that time we were still in session and our transportation department was working so hard they had no time to do that close analysis. Um, now they have time. So as Neil described, they're, they're going through those um, uh, collection of runs, we've basically shaken up all of the runs in the entire district and then put them back together. And Michael Gannon is going through piece by piece by piece to make sure that within those change times that we're looking at, the buses can actually do what needs to be done and get kids to, to their school at the same time. Um, it's slow going, um, but they're working on it. And 
I would not 100% rule it out for the future if the runs can work or if we find that they can't, we can make some kind of adjustment. Um, but what we really need is, is time. So if something happens from a um, legal perspective around the timelines for our budget completion, and we get a little extra time, we might be able to consider it for the fall. I'm so, just putting that out there, but it's it's a lot of ifs, Gloria. All right, but so the uh, the bus proposition wouldn't limit that or inhibit it. No, I don't. I don't think so because okay. we're replacing. Okay. Right. Well, and the the things that we were looking at were sort of uh, neutral financially. Correct. In the start time. Yes. Well, in the most recent iteration that I think the committee saw, there was actually a reduction of bus runs. Right. We, because we're not entirely confident that what happened on paper can happen in actuality, it may or may not be that many freed up bus runs. But if it were, um, and we could pull it off, then I would, I would push to do it in the fall if we could. Wow. So those are big ifs. Because I thought one of them was cost saving. Was it I was. wrong about that? Yeah. yeah no, right. right. Now that the the maybe the one good thing out of this tragedy is that Danielle has time to go over these routes. And is she also considering the possibility if if we had it to move maybe two of the elementary times versus the one or something like that? As I said, now that she has the time, um I, I think we should be open to all options to get it done. So this analysis that they're doing right now will frame up kind of what the what the challenges are in this framework. So, you know, maybe we have to move something five minutes one way or another, or maybe we need to think about two schools starting at the same time at the high school. It depends on where they, they um, uncover the problems. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I'm not going to make a promise one way or another, but I will say that we're working hard on it right now. Now well, that's good news. <laughs> Dr. Wiles, did you say someone emailed um, or sent in a question? In the um, yes. So we got uh, two questions from um, Christine Govan. Um, Christine Govan is a teaching assistant at, at GES, and um, the, she's the TA unit president. So um, I, I handed Neil these on my way in between our um, two parts of our meeting. So I'll just, I'll read her first question um, and we'll do that and then her second. She says, as I understand it, the budget is prepared by carrying over the budget from the previous school year and making adjustments where necessary for mandated increases and other changes. I understand that the current proposal is to use $450,000 of the fund balance to increase the revenue stream for 2020, 2021. What is the current budget to actual for this school year? Do you expect there will be a surplus over budget this year that might offset the $450,000 drawdown? Okay, I'll address those. Um, first, just to give some context to the 450,000 number that uh, Christine had mentioned what we're proposing in next year's budget is an increase of $300,000 in the use of reserves and that was the use of a tax certiorari reserve and then an additional application of $150,500 for fund balance or rainy day funds uh, that comes to $450,500 so that's the context for that statement in terms of where we are projected to be at the end of this school year uh, as of the end of February, and this was shared at the last board meeting, well, we're looking at being about $950,000 below budget in terms of expenses and $125,000 over budget in terms of revenue, so a positive. Right there, that would amount to about $1,075,000, but you have to remember that we've already committed out of fund balance or savings to offset this budget 850,000. So what we're anticipating is at the end of the year, we would we would have a surplus as of the end of February of $225,000. Uh, 
Uh, it's early in the year. We've had a lot of additional expenses, obviously, uh, related to uh, the current pandemic. So there's a lot of things that still have to play out for the end of the year. Uh, so where we are right now um, is just um, a pretty minor uh, surplus at the end of this year if everything were to work out the way it is right now. Uh, but again, we have several months still left in the school year before we'll know the answer to that for sure. Is there any questions on that? Neil, I have a question. Um, is it possible that some of these expenses for cleaning and all that we've had to do and contract out uh, might be offset by some savings on our heating and electricity and gas, you know, for our buses? Uh, that certainly is possible. And that's why we kind of have to see where we end up. And we're still early on in this uh, pandemic in terms of addressing that. Um, where it goes from here, we're not sure and what additional steps might be required. Uh, but you're right, we're also saving some money in other areas that we would normally be spending. So we'll just have to see how that balances out as we go along. Does that include um, cafeteria food? I don't know how much it's costing for these delivering of, of the meals. Um, we're um, not bringing the money in, but... <laughs> yes, food service is separate from the general operating budget, so it's a self-supporting um, right. separate fund, so it really isn't impacting uh, right now, but uh, we do have volunteers assisting with the food uh, delivery of meals at, at this point. We've got a lot of community volunteers, which is great, and they're doing a wonderful job. Megan Beck, who's our food services director, is doing an outstanding job organizing everything, getting the volunteers together, and uh, doing a great job getting uh, food out to those that need it. So that process is, is working very well. Are we getting it to all the, the children that need it as far as we know? Yes, yes. We, uh, it's They're doing a large number of deliveries. Yeah, yeah, surprising. I, yes. But, yeah. I think we, we were at 12,000 meals served uh, as of yesterday. Oh, that's amazing. Wow. Yeah, well, good for, good for Megan. I, that's terrific. Yeah, she has really done an outstanding job. Mm. And they're doing breakfast and lunch, right? Every day of the week or just the school days? Um, they're doing it in two deliveries, uh, through, right. twice a week, but it covers the entire week. Okay, good, good. I That's think wonderful. Saturday is good, but Sunday is not. Okay, all right. Well, the other thing that I, I believe I read is that uh, our district donated some uh, personal protection equipment to yes. Albany County. Yes. I think, you know, we have to give our district and, and Neil a lot of credit for that as well. Well, that was um, really, it's a district effort. Uh, Marie was involved, Cliff Nooney was involved. Um, we heard the appeal for needed supplies. We were fortunate to have um, an extra amount of supplies that we weren't counting on using. We still have enough for our needs. Uh, but what we're able to do is, is give them where they're needed right now, and which is to healthcare workers and hospitals, and we're happy to do that. Thank you for organizing that. Yeah. At some point, Neil, does that come back, or is that just, um, you know what I mean? Do, are they, we don't know. We, <laughs> we do not know. Um, at this point, um, I think that they're where they need to be. Right. Um, we did not have a documented need for that. And again, we have enough for our needs. Uh, so okay. we're not shortchanging ourselves, but certainly we had uh, more than an adequate supply right now for our needs and um, happy to contribute to the cause yeah. in uh, yeah. terms of helping keep our healthcare workers uh, healthy and safe. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Neil, you know, is the process after you hear, you know, after the governor passes the budget, basically kind of iterative, like, you know, as the time passes on and you hear more from state ed, is it just kind of going back and forth to adjust our, our school budget? Uh, yes, I mean, we're really uh, looking to see, uh, obviously, where the state lands in terms of funding of education. Um, and we, we've we got the preliminary idea from the executive proposal, budget proposal, but we really are interested in what the legislature thinks in terms of the overall state aid package. And right now we don't have a good sense of where that is and what it might mean. So uh, we're anxious as everybody else is to figure out what we're going to be dealing with in terms of uh, state aid, which is a good source of revenue for the school district. 
and what that would mean ultimately uh, to our budget process. So everybody's anxious for information, but we all know there's a bigger issue going on right now. <laughs> yeah. Lori, did you have your hand up? Um, what's that? The second question? No, I didn't know if Lori had her hand up for a second. Oh, okay. No, I just have to keep it raised for the swelling. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Other questions? So I did have one more from Christine Govan. Um, right. This one is about TA positions, and she says, uh, you mentioned we're carrying forward five unassigned teaching assistant positions in the budget. Considering that it remains difficult to staff the TA openings at the middle school and high school levels, leaving us with open positions, and we have not used any of the five unassigned TA positions, could you maintain the math science TA and reduce the number of unassigned TA positions to four, thereby maintaining the student to adult ratio in the affected classes? And that's a really interesting point, and I think it's worth taking a look at. I'm, I'm not sure that we haven't used any of the unassigned um, sitting here right now, but um, we can take a look at that. I have a question, Marie. The the three uh, unassigned that, that we have, is that going to be enough? It seems like we always go to use all five. What do we do if we have more needs after we've used up the three you know could we transfer even that ta money you know the unused tas or keep that in hope or well you know we've never used um all five of the five we've come close in some year yeah, yeah. um so we would just need to be very mindful before we award them mm -hmm. um and try to look at the district as a whole and, and solve the problems that are the biggest problems, um, which is, you know, a challenge. But I think with three, we could probably solve two class sections and then leave one for the bits and pieces that often come along with creating new sections around special areas. Um, the vast majority of school districts do not have unassigned positions. So, um, if some critical need were to come up, they would typically handle it by making a transfer from one part of the budget to another. Um, so I, I think um, as we think about trying to close the $1.3 million gap, it was a relatively painless way to do it. Of course, you know, it may be, be more difficult down the road. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, could I just jump in for a minute? Sure. Um, I'm totally with Judy in the fact that if by some miracle, and I, it would be a true miracle if we were to get some more money this year, um, four positions, I'm, I'm much more comfortable with than three. Um, as long as I can remember, we have been using at least three. And it's just nice to have that in your back pocket when you have people moving into town and you know you have to put in an extra classroom but i know it's it's not the highest priority but at least keep thinking about it well i mean we're we're thinking a lot about this budget still um and i probably would be remiss not to to say that some of the things that we're concerned about are um you know the economic impact of this um tremendous challenge we're all living through right now uh, you know, the state has moved tax day, for example, from April 15th to, to July 15th, which means that people can file and pay their taxes later, which is um, great for individuals, but it's going to create a cash flow problem in the state. Oh, yeah. Um, and that could affect us adversely. And I think the comptroller just reassessed the amount of deficit in the New York State budget um, by another, I think it was another $4 billion. Oh, oh wow. So I, I don't anticipate uh, us getting any additional aid. And in <laughs> fact, I think we need to be um, kind of careful about what we end up adopting. Um, and by that, um, or for that reason, this morning, district office team spent about an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes 
looking through all of the proposed reductions that came forward from our administrative team that did not make the March 10th draft. So they had proposed many, many other reductions. So uh, while we would, would not really want to go there, I think we need to be, uh, I think we need to be careful with how we set ourselves up for future years. And um, right now we're using a million dollars worth of fund balance. And I think that's a lot to be able to sustain going forward, especially when you just heard from Neil that as of now, it looks like we've only got about $250,000 of fund balance on a $103 million budget. So I, I honestly think we need to be willing to go maybe a little leaner in 2020, 2021, so that we're not in a dire position in subsequent years. So at some point, we probably should share with the board some of the ideas that we're beginning to work through um, for future discussion. I know we've got a workshop coming up on April 2nd. Um, and maybe be prior to that, we'll show you what we're thinking about and you can weigh in and we can see if it, what we're thinking about makes any sense for the next year's budget. And in the meantime, it would be awesome to kind of know if we're putting a budget out to our voters on in May and or in June or not at all if we do something under the cap. There's just so many uncertainties here. It makes it really hard to uh, make really good, thoughtful decisions that are in the best interest of, of students. Questions? I had several questions in the last meeting, but th that was right before um, the pandemic, I guess, hit. So I think um, some of it, you know, may not be relevant at this time, and I'll just have to wait and see what happens with the, with the rest of the budget. Any other questions? Okay, moving on. The next item on the agenda, personnel action. Uh, the personnel agenda for March 24th, 2020, the financials, oh, I'm sorry, minutes for March 10th, 2020, uh, minutes for meeting, the personnel action for March 24th, and the financials ending February 29th, 2020. Can I have a motion? Second, Judy. Yeah. Any Second, Judy. Aye. 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 Pass the seven. Aye. Pass the seven zero. Okay. Next, information items, curriculum and instruction. Dr. Singleton. Thank you very much. Let's let's start with some good news. Um, I am very delighted to share that we had eight. <laughs> artwork accepted into the 2020-21st high school juried regional exhibition which will be held in the alpalca gallery on march 20th from uh or five from 5 to 8 p.m this year 22 school districts submitted 519 pieces and 108 pieces were selected overall and i'd like to share with you the following students who participated stephen wong of grade 12 uh, entitled burial play and once more Charlotte King, grade 12, Hidden in Plain Sight and Dear God, and What Is That Thing? <laughs> Carrie Yamaguchi, grade 11, Daily Routines. Violet uh, Kreifels, grade 11, A Balancing Act. Rena Ko, grade 11, Goodbye and Childhood. Fatima Schultz, of grade nine, The Modern Thinker. And all of these students are from Sarah Gockley's class. So congratulations to all of them, as well as Mrs. Gockley. And my next item, you may have heard this great news. Um, Trisha McLean, a fifth grade teacher at Pine Bush Elementary School, is one of WNYP News Channel 13's top teachers. Mrs. McLean helps us believe in ourselves and to be confident, and she always dances, said Molly Marteau, a current student in Mama McLean. McLean has been teaching in Gilderland for 15 years. She's also a resident. And we hope that you are able to catch her segment on Channel 13 on Wednesday, March 11th, 2020. And I can say this is a most deserving award, and we want to extend congratulations to Mrs. McLean for this great honor. 
And finally, uh, the big news, I guess. We've been extremely busy over the course of the past week, uh, week to 10 days. And much of our work is focused on remote learning, uh, establishing our readiness and our capacity to be delivering school to 5,000 students via uh, some distance learning opportunities. And there's a lot that's behind the scenes happening. So I wanted to just provide you with somewhat of an update here. So over the course of our first week of this extended school closure, we have been furiously attempting to keep up with the demands for technology, online resources, and remote learning opportunities. This has been an immense undertaking, as you might imagine, with very few personnel on site to assist and minimal time available to our teachers and our leaders for planning. And this was due to the immediate closure in Gilderland schools on March 13th for the Department of Health's guidance and requirements. So all of the collaborations, the planning, the gathering of resources, development of websites, identification of technology needs, et cetera, have been done remotely. Uh, again, with the exception of a, a handful of people who have been on site during this time. Regardless of these challenges, we have moved forward and we have been able to transition to remote learning for our students. Our teachers have been amazing as they have shared resources and lessons, they've exchanged ideas, they have built online management systems. Uh, Etc. So I must also thank our coordinators for instructional, instructional technology, Natalia Lemoyne, who has worked countless hours to curate, to compile, and to create new websites and online resources so that teachers, students, and parents have easy and quick access to these materials. All of the collected resources can be found on our district website. In addition to academic resources, Lisa Knowles and her team have compiled, compiled tools and resources to support the social emotional well-being of our students during this very stressful time. And while I am thanking a few people, I also want to thank Michael Bastian and Tammy McGill, who have been extremely helpful to me in getting the technology in the hands of students who need the technology, and that includes, includes internet connection as well. So from a technology view, our first priority during week one was to ensure that all of our students are connected so that we were able to keep them engaged with their teachers, their classes, and the available resources. We've worked closely with internet providers to ensure that all families had internet access regardless of needs or geography. Spectrum Internet Cable generously offered all students and families free internet for 60 days with no installation fees, and Verizon provided the district with 50 hotspots that have been needed or that have been distributed to our neediest family or to the regions where internet access was not available otherwise. Instructionally, uh, as we continue to, to make sure that students are connected and gain confidence that we can deliver instruction to all of our students, uh, immediately following the March 13th closure, the district developed a flexible learning plan which outlines the critical considerations and steps that we will take when school is closed and when we are facilitating learning remotely. A variety of online platforms are now being used by teachers at all levels for the distribution of materials, communications, live streaming, video conferencing, etc. The majority of our teachers are utilizing Google Classroom as the primary hub for their classes. Many elementary teachers are also using Seesaw for these purposes. Additionally, with support and guidance from principals and instructional administrators and the technology department, Teachers are regularly collaborating with each other using Google Hangouts Meet, as we are doing tonight, or other online tools that are available to them. And despite the many challenges faced thus far, learning is and will continue. Many challenges and hurdles remain. Many questions have yet to be answered by the state and federal education departments and other agencies. So these are indeed uncharted waters, but we will be diligent in our efforts to engage all of our students during this unforeseen crisis. Um, I'll also just build upon this update a bit to share with you that there are also some regional coordinations that are taking place through Capital Region BOCES right now. Uh, I'm on a conference call, a Zoom uh, call every morning, WebEx actually every morning with all of the assistant superintendents as well as representatives from Cap Region BOCES and they are very ambitiously trying to develop a regional uh, repository of lessons and resources and materials for all of the teachers in the capital region. Um, again, it's a very ambitious timeline. They actually want it to be accessible to all teachers in the region by April 1st. 
Um, and the work has just started this week. So again, very ambitious. And then also have that accessible to parents and students by April 6th. So we will keep you updated on that. Um, there have been questions about the focus of instruction over the course of the past week, which uh, indeed, as Marie shared in one of her updates, our first priority was to make sure that we were engaging every single student, that we were not leaving any pockets of students behind uh, because of unique needs that they may have, whether they be special ed needs or economic needs, technology needs, et cetera. Uh, so we did ask our teachers to focus largely on reinforcement of skills, uh, practice, support of, of prior learning, those types of things during the first week, but we are looking forward to and actively planning to move forward with new instruction in the coming days and weeks. Um, of course, we don't know yet what the extent of the closure will be as of today. We are still operating under the understanding that we will be returning on April 1st, but I think all of us probably assume that that's not realistic at this point in time, but there has been no official notice from the state about an extension of the closure. So, you know, much of the work ahead will depend on what we hear from the governor and from the state, whether it's just another two week extension of the closures or whether we go as far as some other states and close for the duration of the school year. So much yet to be determined, but a tremendous amount of work has been happening behind the scenes and I'm still shaking my head and thinking, oh my God, this has only been one week. Wow. <laughs> Stay tuned, but that's where we are as of today. Damien, do we have any way to know how many students are actually uh, involved with this? Are they all involved? So that's one of the things that we've been asking all of our principals and instructional administrators to work with their teachers on is if we do notice that there are students who simply are not connecting or not engaging, we want to reach out to those families directly and really work with them to make sure that number one they have access that they can do it but number two that we really have to establish some routines at home as well if we are to continue learning with all of our students so that's data that we're trying to collect over time uh, many teachers have reported that indeed we do have some students who just have not signed on um, and have not engaged but we are hoping as we go forward into the, the coming days and weeks that we're, we're going to have a more formal schedule established, uh, one that parents can work from as well, so they can, they can really think about what a day will look like when students are learning at home. Um, we also are trying not to have any conflicts amongst teachers. So, you know, teachers need to know that if I'm teaching algebra at this time and the child's English teacher is teaching it at the same time, where do they go? Um, so we're trying to not step on each other's toes. It's uh, it's a challenge, but I think we're working on some structures and some systems that will make that a little bit more reliable and efficient for our students and our families. Thank you. Thank you. Were there enough hotspots then with the that donation from Rod to cover? So Yes, we still have a few on hand. Uh, we literally the day after or the day of our for our closure, March 13th, we had the Verizon rep in here and basically begged them to give us hotspots. Um, they were able to come through with 50 right away for us, which was very helpful. But we've saw, we've also been informed that they have no more inventory. So what we have on hand, we are trying to be really judicious in how we distribute that. Um, many families have taken up Spectrum on their offer for free internet, which of course means we don't have to provide a hotspot device. So we've really been encouraging parents to inquire about that. Um, one very important point, if we do have any families that are listening who have engaged with Spectrum, that after the 60 day period, they will have to notify Spectrum to turn it off if bills are not to be forthcoming. So they have to pay attention to that 60 day window. A couple, um, we had a couple questions around this topic that came in when we um, um, alerted our community. So um, both of them that are directly around this um, online instruction and uh, seeking more information about plans and pr procedures for students and new learning on um, on these platforms. Damien, can you talk a little bit about timeline or a little bit more about timeline? People are looking for structure. 
They're looking for normalcy. They're looking for routines and they want to see their kids continuing to learn new stuff. Yeah, totally understood. Um, again, I think our, our priorities initially were making sure everyone was connected. Uh, we also had to uh, give a, a due amount of consideration to our students with disabilities and how they can be supportive in this type of an environment. So our special ed department has been thinking and working with our, our teachers and our administrators and how it is they can provide direct supports where they are uh, still mandated under their IEPs. So those those big challenges hopefully are, are being rectified at this point. And as we go forward, like I said, the especially at the high school and the middle school where we literally have hundreds of teachers competing for time, the structures are necessary. Uh, Mike Piscatelli and Mike Laster, the principals at the high school and middle school respectively have been uh, working quite hard on establishing that that schedule that will guide teachers and how they go forward with their instruction. Um, I think at this point in time, it's safe to say that the overwhelming majority, if not all of our teachers have an online platform established. Um, we have to keep in mind that when we closed on March 13th, there were some teachers who were still not operating on an online platform. So there was a tremendous learning curve for a number of teachers who had to build that before they could really uh, you know, lunge ahead into this remote learning world. I think at this point, there's been so much collaboration and sharing amongst teachers that uh, I'm very confident that, again, the overwhelming majority of teachers are ready to move forward at this point in time. So with that said, um, you know, there's been a lot of planning behind the scenes, a lot of sharing about what new instruction will look like. Once we have the, the schedules established, which I think will be by the end of this week for sure. So once we go into next week, we should be able to operate under those schedules. And from that point forward, it will be delivery of new instruction. Um, there's still questions out there about how do you grade, how do you assess in these environments now? I mean, it's really a, a very uncharted world that we're going into from a K through 12 learning perspective. So we, uh, again, request the patience if, if parents will give it to us as we develop this as we go. Um, but I think by next week, we should be off and running with new instruction going forward. That's great. We, we also had a question about um, college uh, classes that are offered at the high school that come with college credit, like AP, um, SUPA, that's Syracuse University Project Advance. Um, and I've been in communication with Mike Piscatelli, and he's been working with the colleges we work with. Those courses are still going ahead. Colleges are very well equipped to, to go online, so we are on track to offer credit in those courses. Um, and AP announced a few days ago now, about five days ago, that they're gonna be offering a online exam on the content covered through March that students will be able to take and um, use toward their, um, you know, their portfolio of credit for high school. So, you know, I think, I think those will largely go forward as planned. The ELA and the math tests were canceled, right? But the, there's nothing about the regions yet. There's nothing from the state. Not about yet. Not yet. We haven't heard any updates about that. I think the Board of Regents is talking about that this week. So um, we'll get some guidance on that. That's a huge discussion for sure. Hey, Danny, I have a, I have a question. Um, in regards to online video conferencing, is there any parental consent that's required? Um, uh, yeah, that, that's a very big question. Um, again, being uncharted territories, there's a lot that we're learning right now about the, I guess, the relevance and the, uh, the requirements under laws like FERPA, which is the Family Education Right to Privacy Act, as well as some new, some new legislation in New York State around Ed Law 2D. Um, I actually, before executive session, I don't know if you were online, but I asked Jeff Honeywell if he had any updates regarding some of these online platforms. There are definitely questions. There are definitely some concerns. Um, you know, at this point in time, I think from a, a parental permission perspective, I think, you know, a parent in this environment, I think they have 
they have decisions to make here about how far they want to engage in this. But really, the only delivery mechanisms that we have are some of these online platforms right now. Um, but there are still a lot of questions to be answered. Um, you know, we've been in direct contact with some companies out there, Zoom, Google, uh, for Google Hangouts Meets and, and the Zoom accounts as well. And, you know, all of them are, are I will say, generously offering free access to these services. Um, but they also openly admit that they were not developed for K through 12 online learning. So they too, I think, are learning. I think they're, you know, they're putting their offers out there. I will tell you, I have been inundated with free access emails from just about every technology company you could imagine. Um, you know, I, I, I am optimistic that they're doing it with, you know, a, a caring mindset for schools and for students at this point in time. But I think. In all reality, I think there's there's opportunity that's there for some of these companies as well. So we're being very careful. We're vetting every company that we're engaging with. Uh, there are some that we have asked teachers to pause in use of with students. Zoom is one of them right now uh, because we, you know, we have some unanswered questions about their terms and conditions and their expectations and things that uh, we just need some answers to before we proceed forward with that. Zoom is a great tool, there's no question about that, but there are also some compliance questions that we have to get some answers to. Other questions? In the world. All right, thank you, Damien. You're welcome. And next on the agenda is Superintendent Information, Dr. Weil. Okay, um, my first uh, two items are about cancellations. Um, sadly, we are uh, was we are in need of canceling our job fair for this year. Uh, we had um, planned on meeting on April sixth. Um, we had uh, thirty four school districts and other organizations who were going to gather here to um, meet new prospective employees. And of course, given social distancing, uh, we had to cancel that. So I, I know that Lynn Severance, who is the engine behind that, is hugely disappointed. Um, it's always a great event and she does a great job. So this was a, you know, this was a tough cancellation to make. One of many, one of many. And then the um, other item I wanted to mention was our joint trustees meeting with the Gilderland Public Library. We've postponed that. Um, I know the library is still very interested in having that meeting. Um, we will maybe explore some uh, remote ways of doing that to avoid, you know, the social, um, you know, the gathering of social social people in, in one spot. So uh, I'll work with the director on that. <laughs> um, and then my last item here is um, just a little bit more about some of the uh, behind the scenes of our school closure in this whole. Um, I don't even know what to call it, this <laughs> brave new world we're in. Um, but I, I think I wanna just underscore a point that Damien made a couple times um, about when we were closed and how the fact that the Department of Health closed us down at four o'clock in the morning on Friday, um, three days before other schools in New York State were closed, really, um, really challenged us to try to get online learning up and running. You know, teachers left without plan books and their materials, uh, students left without musical instruments and their Chromebooks. So everything we did had to be on the fly. And I, I am getting emails from families that are frustrated that they see their friends from a neighboring district seemingly doing business as usual online. And if that's so, that's awesome. Um, we will get there. Just today, we started letting small groups of teachers back into the buildings, elementary in, this week we're doing elementary and high school because we are now not officially closed in those buildings by the Department of Health. So teachers can get materials and the things they need in order to plan new instruction. Uh, middle school will hit its two week mark on Friday. And so middle school teachers will be able to go in and get their materials on Friday and we're also gonna give Saturday as an option for them. So that was a huge game changer for us to just have that abrupt 
closure and now no one can come in the building. Um, so I just want to make that a very clear point for our community. Um, the other thing I want to mention, we've communicated with our families yesterday about musical instruments. I think I got more uh, emails about musical instruments that didn't make it home than anything else, um, including from our instructional administrator for music, Bob Winans, who strongly advocated um, to help us collect those instruments. But we needed to be mindful of the fact that our buildings were closed by the Department of Health. Um, we have a plan for parents to come and collect those instruments. We're actually going to have people drive up and submit their request. Um, and people are going to run into the building and bring them out. And so by Monday, all children will be back to practicing their instruments. Some will thank me, some may not. <laughs> um, the other thing I just want to mention is essential staff. We are working on very, very small numbers of people coming in only to do essential things. Um, so in the district office at any given time, there's three people. Um, there's one person in any given building at any time. But in the, you know, we still are required to provide uh, meals, which is a labor intensive task. So that's happening. Uh, we were charged with coordinating childcare for um, essential employees. Um, we're doing that in partnership with the Y. Actually, the Y is doing it, and we're helping them get word out um, that they are open now to provide child care for families who need it, with a um, priority being for people who work in hospitals, policemen, fire department, EMT, all of those titles who um, are certainly working very hard right now. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention, because I know Damien talked a lot about remote instruction, which is another huge piece of our work. Um, but today uh, we ended up closing all of our playgrounds. Uh, they had not been closed and people were visiting them. And when I wrote to our families to say, essentially, you know, we can't disinfect these. We can keep them functionally safe, but we don't have the people to um, uh, to disinfect them, I got a lot of feedback and it was appropriate feedback to say, why are they open at all? So uh, Cliff today closed them all and un until school opens, um, we will keep those closed as well in order to protect um, the safety and health of our community and practice social um, distancing. And the last thing I'll just say is really encourage our community to continue checking our website Amy Peratt has been posting all kinds of information on there regularly. It's scrolling along the bottom. There's resources for instruction, for mental health, for um, meals, for um, students with disabilities and the latest um, information about how we serve them. So please visit our website. It's just uh, a, a, um, replete with information. Okay, that's all I have to say right now about that. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wiles. Sure thing. Next on the agenda, board president information. The first item is the Capital Region Doses Budget and Board Election Vote. I know it was originally scheduled for Wednesday, April 22nd at 8 in the morning. That's like that short vote that we used to meet for. I haven't heard anything else, but I anticipate that it's not happening or maybe it's moved. I don't know. Uh, unless, Marie, you've heard anything different. But they're going to, um, I think we're going to continue doing it, except that it will be, um, we'll do it on, we'll do it this on, on this kind of a platform. Remotely. Okay. Yep. And then. Um, Seema, sorry. Yes. What's that? What's the date for that again? The, the April 22nd. I think it's a Wednesday. Okay. Yep. Wednesday, April 22nd at 8 a.m. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, the second item is the upcoming Board of Education election. I know we talked last time about we have five seats open. Um, I've been looking for information as to what's going to happen with the vote. I haven't found anything except that uh, people who are petitioning to get signatures should not be meeting with other people in person and to practice social distancing. Um, so if I hear anything else or Dr. Wiles hears anything else about how this election or vote will take place. I think we're just waiting to hear from the state. 
to hear some guidance from the state. Any questions? So we cannot get the signatures, right? I mean, we can't go house to house. So no. we can't go gather signatures. No, that document that I think I forwarded you from the state said, do not go and gather right. signatures because we have to practice social distancing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm guessing, you know, as soon as we hear, if I'll pass it, you know, pass it along to you guys if you if you don't hear. So we'll have to just play it by ear for right now. Okay. Uh, Seema? Yes. There, there is a way of still practicing the social distancing, assuming that they maybe would still require 25%. If you call somebody, one of your friends, ask them to pick up the petition on their doorstep, they sign it, they call you while you stand outside, they use their own pen. I mean, it's complicated, but if we have to do that, you know, that's one way of doing it with social distancing. I know someone has mentioned before, but there's some like I petition, but before, you know, I guess, you know, people can, can go the way that you mentioned, Barb, if, if they want to seems a little labor intensive, but. Oh, it is, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, if we want it, you know, before we say, yes, the I petition is okay, I think we need to wait to hear from the state on what's acceptable. Right. It's 2%, Barb, not 25%. If you have 2% of the number of people. No, 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 they're saying that they may reduce our original number, which I think was what, 82 for this year by 25%. Okay, well, it's yeah. still a lot if you can't yeah. go door to door. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Stay tuned. Yeah. Um, next action item, school business management, Neil? Yes, it's good to talk a little bit about routine business for the school district for a change. <laughs> Uh, so I have uh, three items this evening. The first is a stipulation of settlement agreement, and this is related to two properties. They're affordable housing properties within the town of Gilderland. One is Brandel Limited Partnership, and the other was Fairway Limited Partnership. Um, there was an Article 78, a court proceeding initiated by those property owners, um, challenging the assessment that was placed on the property is last year when the town of Gilderland did a townwide reassessment. Uh, that resulted in settlement discussions between the parties, and there's a recommendation uh, to accept the settlement, uh, the reduced assessments that are shown. So uh, for the Brandle property, the reduced assessment would be $1.6 million, and for the Fairway property, the reduced assessment would be about $2.1 million. Can I get a motion to accept the stipulation of agreement? So moved. And second, oh, Gloria, second. any questions? Yeah, Neil, were we counting on these being reduced in, in the when we have it in the budget? Um, well, we have money in the budget for tax search rates or tax right. changes, assessment reductions. We still have about $100,000 or $200,000, excuse me, left in that account. We've spent uh, roughly 100000 of the 300000 that we had budgeted. Uh, this will amount to about $47,000 in terms okay. of a tax refund, so um, we can afford to pay that out of the budget allocation that we have. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Passed it 7 0. Uh, next is an application for a refund or credit of real property taxes. Uh, this was a case where the property owner was eligible for an aged exemption, and, which was approved, but inadvertently it was left off the tax roll, the exemption. Uh, so the property owner is owed a credit of about $425, and that's recommended for your approval. Can I have a motion to accept the application for refund of property taxes? So moved. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Gloria? Second, Judy? Yeah. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Seven, zero. And then finally, we have uh, two general fund transfers totaling $57,344. Uh, one is to uh, increase the allocation for computer assisted instruction, and one is to allocate additional funds for charter school tuition payments. Can I have a motion to accept the general fund transfer? 
So moved. Barb, second Gloria. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes seven zero. Okay. Thank you, Neil. Next board president action. We have um, three policies here that we are going to adopt. Um, graduation requirements, student attendance, graduation for student attendance. So can I have a motion to accept the policy adoption? I move. Gloria, second. Rebecca, any questions? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Um, aye. Aye. That's a seven zero. Next board committee report. Uh, we'll start with policy. <laughs> Our meeting was canceled. Yep. Uh, what about communications? I believe our meeting is still on um, for Thursday at four o'clock, obviously remotely uh, to discuss budget outreach and obviously coronavirus response. Thank you. And business practices. Oh, we have we have not met. <laughs> and last audit. I don't have my portal up. I can't remember if we canceled the meeting or if it was rescheduled. It, it's canceled and yet to be rescheduled. Thank you. All right, next board issues, ideas and sharing. Anybody have anything to share? Just a thank you to our uh, DOT for the hard work they've been doing. This has got to be just <laughs> Not something anybody signed up for, and I know they've been working really hard. And a special thank you to Damien for helping me out. <laughs> yeah, I want to thank DOT for all of their work and all of um, the teachers as well. I know oh, I'm in a position being home, trying to take care of your family, and then also <laughs> not really working from home when everybody else is home. So thank you to all of them, and thanks for people you know being patient so they can get their classes up online. And then also to Megan Beck because I know that's a huge coordination to get the meals out um, and to all the volunteers. I mean, I was on that list and there were, you know, she was, no, she was not short of volunteers. So that's just like a great feeling to know you're part of a, a giving community. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And to all, the, to all the teachers who are reaching out in such creative ways to their students. I mean, the drive through the neighborhoods that's going on, the online stuff, it's just been yeah. really amazing to watch. And I'm sure they'll all be as glad as we are when they work out, but they what's have normal, what's normal. Yeah. Oh, I will. I'll be happy to send my kids back to school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I bet you're not alone in that either. I second that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, on, on that note, I, I had one more um, email that I think I, that I forgot to read to you. It's from a Mrs. Jennifer Henderson. And uh, she said, I just actually want to submit a thank you to the school district. I'm a hospital employee. And I came home yesterday to find a bag of food on my door for my child. Oh. And with all the stress everyone is going through, this uh, going through, this uh, showed me a glimmer of hope. Thank you. This is why I live in, love, live in and love Gilderland. It's always been about the school district. I will never forget this act of kindness from the school and the volunteers. And that's Jennifer Henderson from the Westmere area. Nice, nice. So nice. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so any other sharing? All right, so can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion. R. Yeah. Second, Rebecca, all in favor? Aye. 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 Passes 7 0.